He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought. It certainly is a blessed thought to have uh, someone who will lead us spiritually in these uh, odd times that we find ourselves. So may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and welcome to this time of virtual worship on this fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, Once again, we're in the sanctuary of Batesville United Methodist Church, one of three churches on the Monacan Trail Cooperative Parish. Parish also includes Mount Olivet and Trinity United Methodist Churches. Uh, It is a blessing to have you join us here today. Our prayer is that you will be blessed uh, in hearing the word and hearing song uh, as you join us in this time of worship. And so now I invite you to join in unison as we pray our opening prayer. The words will be on the screen. I invite you to pray aloud and, and for you and everyone who's with you to pray. So let us pray. We are standing at the gate, O loving shepherd, not sure about the journey. But you have called our names, and in your voice we hear such love and surety. Bring us safety on the journey and strengthen us that we may serve you in all that we do. Amen. Amen, and and I give thanks. for your attendance with us today. Uh, If you have worshiped with us before, you know that uh, we usually have a time during our service of what I call God sightings. It's it's a time when those that are present, if there were someone present here today, can lift up and give testimony and witness to where they have seen God act in their lives or in the lives of someone around them. Uh, In the absence of uh, face-to-face worship, uh, I've asked the parish members to uh, share with me their God sightings via email. Uh, I have uh, just a couple this week. Um, Some weeks uh, I suggest that maybe God was quiet or maybe we we were so concentrating on being with God uh, and in meditation that Uh, We just failed to recognize or weren't able to share something. But this week I have a God sighting uh, again from uh, George and Gloria. Uh, It seems that they went for a walk this past week. Uh, George says, our God sighting this week was being grateful for God's creation of nature. Walking outside one morning, to our surprise, we were met by a pair of Canadian geese in our side yard. This had never happened before. Feeling a bit housebound, we decided to go fishing. We saw more geese, one sitting on her nest and her mate guarding close by. Turtles on logs, purple martins flying by. Beautiful mountain laurel blooming on the banks. And we did catch a few fish. Just taking life slower these days and enjoying the beautiful creatures God has created for us to enjoy. Returning home, we still enjoy our squirrels, deer, and two visiting bears. So I thank George and Gloria for sharing that. Uh, Yes, uh, God is present in the creation. In fact, the scriptures tell us that all you have to do is walk outside your house and look around uh, to see evidence that there has to be a God. Now, the other God sighting is mine, and and I just just continue uh, to receive... Uh, cases of, of so many people coming to the aid of others who are are unable uh, are unwilling to go out in public because of compromised health and it's it 's a blessing to see how much uh, people are are jumping in and and helping those uh, in those situations um, and I also see God in some of the humor. Uh, there was a posting on Facebook this past week 
where, where a lady just left a, a text message and she said, uh, went to the store wearing masks to buy groceries, got home, unpacked groceries, removed the mask, oops, came home with the wrong husband. Be careful out there. So, you know, I, I think sometimes if we can see humor in, in what doesn't always feel to be a humorous situation, uh, it can help relieve some of the stress. It can help relieve some of our, our anxieties. And, and so I, you know, I give thanks for, for all that's taking place and with people helping, with people trying to cut the edge with a bit of humor. Um, and, and, uh, but of course, like everyone, I pray for that day uh, that we will be able to worship again uh, as a gathered body of Christ. So I invite you now to uh, uh, lift up your voices and, and to sing with our virtual choir as we sing our opening hymn today, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Won't you sing? Savior like a shepherd lead us. Uh, we do uh, look to God as our shepherd. And so at this time, I invite you to once again settle your hearts and minds uh, as you hear our liturgists read uh, today's gospel lesson. John 10, 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, any one who does not enter the sheep's pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. 
The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That was the word of God for the people of God, and we give thanks to God for those words. Uh, would you pray with me? Our gracious God, we do give you great thanks for these words that were recorded by your faithful servant, the Apostle John. And we pray now as we reflect upon these words, as we, we dig into these words and, and, and understand how they, uh, how they are mingled with our lives today, uh, that it will always be your words and your words only uh, that are spoken here today. I pray that it will be only your words that are carried forth from here uh, after the end of this service. We ask this in your name. Amen. So sheep were a common part of uh, the biblical culture. Uh, they were an animal that was commonly seen along the countryside or out in fields. It turns out that sheep are pretty dumb. I, I don't know any better way of putting it. Uh, God seems to have created sheep to be almost totally dependent upon humans for their care. Now, I'm human, and I know a lot of humans, and if I were a sheep, I, I think I would worry about that, being dependent so much on humans. But God also created shepherds. You know, Jesus often spoke to the people in metaphors, and it was always out of an effort to try to connect the unfamiliar, like especially those radical new teachings that Jesus brought, those interpretations of the scripture that he was teaching his apostles. Jesus used metaphor to try to connect those unfamiliar things with the more familiar things of everyday life. He connected spiritual principles to common things of everyday life. And so he used the metaphor of us being sheep and that he is being our shepherd. Now this connection to God being the shepherd goes way back into the Old Testament, into the Psalms. If you recall, Psalm 23 begins with, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. So as the shepherd, Jesus seeks to hold the sheep together. All the sheep. Not just those with the perfect coats, but also those with the matted and dirty coats. Not just those who were physically well off, but also those that are crippled. And also the sheep that are shunned by the other sheep. Jesus desires, the shepherd desires to keep them all together. He seeks to bring into the fold the sheep with darker coats, or coats that aren't perfect, 
the ones with coats that grow differently in some way or another. The shepherd protects and keeps the sheep safe. Now, for about 14 years, we had a valued and loved member of the Worley household in Ruckersville. Uh, this member of our household was a Cocker Spaniel uh, who, whose name was Andy. We chose the word, uh, the name Andy for him when I brought him home. The, the picture that you're seeing on the screen isn't actually Andy, but it certainly could have been a clone of uh, young Andy uh, not long after we got him. Now, we weren't interested in putting a physical fence around our yard to contain him. Our house is in a subdivision, and uh, it did not seem like it would have been uh, in, in, in the right flavor, you might say, of having a fenced-in yard. Okay, so, but I want, still wanted to keep Andy safe from running out into the street. And so I went down to Lowe's and bought a generic version of an invisible fence. And installing it became a father-daughter project. I went through the whole training procedure that was documented with the instructions. This was back in the mid-90s. Uh, and and the, the kit came with a VHS tape. Of, of how to go about training your dog. I put those flags all around the yard. You've probably driven past homes and seen all these little white flags. Uh, it was to provide a visible clue to Andy that he was getting too close to the invisible fence. So each day, or maybe even several times a day, I would take Andy out on a leash and teach him where the boundaries were. His, his collar would beep if you got a little too close. And if he insisted on pulling at the leash and getting closer and closer, eventually he would receive a very unpleasant shock. Now, I, I say that based on how he reacted. I would never shock to myself with the collar to see what it felt like. But after about six weeks or so, Andy had learned these boundaries very well. Now, the instructions that came with the fence also said that in addition to teaching him where the fence was, that we needed to teach Andy where the invisible gate was. Now, that, that sounds a little odd at first, but think about it. If we wanted to take Andy for a walk in the neighborhood, where would he go out? So part of the training process was to teach Andy that when we took his collar off, attached a leash to his regular collar, that it was safe for him to walk out through the driveway. The driveway is where we chose to have our invisible gate. Now, I remember the first time that I did that, Andy was reluctant to do it. Okay, and so I ended up picking him up and carrying him across the fence, the invisible fence. He squirmed a little bit, but it didn't take him long to learn that it was okay to go out that way, through the driveway, as long as somebody was with him and that he was on a leash. He learned that because he trusted us. He had faith in us that we would not do something that would harm him or cause him pain. This invisible enclosure was so effective that Andy still stayed within its confines, even when I had forgotten to replace the battery in his collar and it stopped working. For Andy, the invisible fence was every bit as effective as a rock wall around our yard. I believe in Andy's mind that he knew that unless he left with us, on a leash, 
through that gate, the invisible gate, that everywhere else there was danger and pain beyond the confines of this wall. Now, in biblical times, there was often a a low uh, rock wall around people's homes, and it was there that they could pin up sheep at night. The sheep knew that they would be safe within this pen. There was generally only one entrance into this enclosed area, and so the sheep would follow the shepherd through this opening through this gate because they trusted him. They knew his voice and knew that the shepherd wouldn't do anything to cause them pain. Now in a way, through this opening, this gate, the shepherd would run his fingers through each of their, uh, the sheep's fur as they entered the pen. He was checking for injuries or burrs that had gotten tangled up in their their fur or, or checking for anything else that needed to be taken care of. Now, most of these pens didn't have a physical gate or barrier. And so after the sheep got inside, the shepherd would literally lay on the ground across the opening, placing his body where he could keep the sheep from escaping and importantly blocking entry against thieves and wolves who would harm the sheep. The shepherd himself would be the gate. The shepherd would lay himself down across the opening Jesus, the shepherd, laid down his life for the flock, for us. He calls us into his fold. He allows us to refuse that if we so choose. But if we do choose to enter through the gate, if we do choose to enter through Jesus Christ, that he becomes our protector and caregiver, not only of our bodies, but also of our souls. Jesus, the shepherd, seeks to keep all of the sheep together. I think the identity of the flock is defined by this relationship between them and the shepherd. And I see in in likewise the identity of the church, the gathered body of Christ, is demonstrated in a clear relationship between the teachings and the examples of Jesus for his followers. The example that through him we will be saved. That through him as a gathered body of Christ we are saved. I think an important point here to understand is the shepherd sees what we cannot see. Or maybe another way of thinking about it, the shepherd sees what sometimes we refuse to see. Sometimes we refuse to see the danger beyond the gate. The shepherd knows the names of everyone in the flock. And by grace, he also knows the name of those who have not yet joined the flock. He knows the names of those who await the invitation or those who struggle with their decision. In in these days that we find ourselves of self-imposed containment, I, I wonder 
if you might consider the question, who is protecting your gate? Are you relying upon Jesus, the good shepherd? Or do you have an invisible gate? Or a non-existent gate? I think we know that from Genesis that we were created to be holy creatures because we were created in the image of God. And that means, for me, I believe it means that we are created to come alongside the shepherd, Jesus, who has entrusted us as his flock of followers, as his flock of the gathered body of Christ in the church. He has entrusted us to do ministry in the world. In these times of distancing and isolation, ministry doesn't stop. It looks different. It takes on different ways of taking place. But ministry still continues. And I think it's the shepherd that offers the invitation for us into ministry. Ministry to care for one another, to love one another as God loves us, as the shepherd loves his sheep. So much so that he would lay himself down to protect them. During these times of isolation, I, I suggest that you listen to the shepherd. Listen for the shepherd's voice. And don't neglect to reach out to others. Even in this time of distancing. A phone call. A Zoom meeting. Whatever it is that allows you to stay connected. Writing a card. What happened to the old school of writing letters to each other? anxiously waiting at the mailbox for a reply. It's during these times that we most need to stay connected and love one another. To love one another as the flock that Jesus loves. I invite you during this time to enter the gate Enter the gate where Jesus stands and to be held in his loving arms and to reach out and invite others. And to God be the glory. Amen. So our time for worship together now comes to a close. Uh, I invite you to return uh, next week as you are able. Uh, next week is Mother's Day. And uh, I'm not sure what that's going to look like with uh, virtual worship, uh, but I trust that somewhere between now and then, uh, God will show me. So uh, here are these words of benediction for this week. Our gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of the shepherd, your son. We give you thanks that he knows our name, that he calls to us. Give us the strength as we go forth in our lives to listen to that call, to enter the gate, and to be together with the flock of Jesus Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. Bless me the tide that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship
Go forth in peace.